All right, welcome to lecture nine. It's about programming the database. Uh, this used to be a major focus in this course, but it's gotten to the point now where it's an aside. Uh, I still need to cover it because it's on the course outline. So I must do it. However, um, whereas this used to be two full lectures, this will take about 20 minutes. You're getting the, uh, the non-technical version of this lecture. Okay, so when you're programming the database, you guys so far have been typing SQL in happily away. Technically, you haven't been programming. You've been querying. You've been interacting with the database. It's like when you open up a DOS prompt or a Linux prompt and you type in LS. Same idea. You're interacting with a, an environment and it's responding. When you're programming by now, you guys have learned what programming is, I hope a little bit by now, where you write a series of instructions, something causes it to run, and it doesn't. You know, that's programming, at least at level one. Find the bug. Now, when you program the database, on the other hand, most database servers give you three spots or types of programs you can write. You can write your own functions. Okay, you guys know what functions are, so you know, I don't really need to go into details about functions in Java, but functions in a database pretty much are the same idea, except you don't have classes wrapped around it. You know how you guys use aggregate functions, average, min, max, or you use the string function like lower, upper, those kinds of things, those are functions. You can actually write your own functions to do magic sauce. If you want to generate passwords on the fly, you can create a, a function for that. If you want a hashing algorithm, or maybe when you create a new customer, you need to assign them uh, some magic piece of information. You could actually write a function that does that. Uh, you can create something called stored procedures. Um, have you guys learned about batch files in your computer essentials class? Hot damn. Picture batch files, database edition. It's a series of commands that run that aren't and the, their, the purpose is to have a series of commands like clearing out database tables, updating your materialized views, maintenance. That's what they're for. And then there's triggers. Um, I'll be spending a fair amount of time in this you know, short little lecture on triggers. Uh, triggers are timed events. Not ti they're events that happen at certain times. Uh, thus, they're triggered because you, know, you trigger them and stuff happens. Now, Postgres is cool because most database servers give you one language to work with. Oracle gives you something called um, PSQL, Procedural SQL. Sybase products, which are now owned by SAP, offer you, give you something called Transact SQL, TSQL. MySQL offers you something called Runtime. Why is it called Runtime? I have no idea, but it looks like code that was written in the 80s when you write in it. It's like written basic. Microsoft SQL Server offers you Transact SQL due to historical reasons because they share it shares history with the stuff from Sybase and it offers C Sharp which is nifty. Postgres offers four languages out of the box and at last I checked there's 14 other languages you can use. There's PGSQL, which is basically 90% compatible with Oracle's language. There's a language called TCL, also known as Tickle. It's a dead language. Only, the only place I've ever seen it used in the last 10 years is in Postgres. Um, Perl. Perl is the king of spaghetti code. Uh, found everywhere on every Linux install. And Python, everybody's favorite new reptile-based language. You can tr write your, your functions, your server procedures, and triggers in any of those languages. Um, and as an aside, other languages that are available inside of Postgres, PL Java. Yes, you could write your functions in Java if you want inside Postgres. Why would you want to do that? I have no idea. But you can. You can also write it in, somebody here studied stats, and every time I ask, there's usually a hand that goes up. Oh, he's not here today. Oh, well. There's actually a language called PLR, which is a stats language. You can actually write stats functions 
with native stats language inside Postgres, which is cool. Um, it's also got OpenCL. For those of you that don't know, that allows you to use your, your graphics card to do math. So theoretically, you could get your Postgres server to decrypt strings using OpenCL. Nifty features. Now, functions versus stored procedures. In Postgres, they're essentially the same thing. Postgres 11 just got differentiated stored procedures up till about a year and a half ago, two years ago. Functions and proceed stored procedures were the exact same thing. They were defined the same way, you called them the same way, they did the same thing. However, there are some generally accepted differences between them. A function returns a value. Just like in Java, most functions return a value unless it's a void function. But normally it will return something. A stored procedure does not. Just like your DOS batch file, it does stuff, it ends, and there's nothing that comes out of it because it's over. A procedure is a set of commands. Wait, so are functions. I don't know why it says so do functions. So are functions. Technically, they're both sets of commands except the purpose is different. A function should not alter the structure of the database. In other words, you use it to manipulate a string, generate a password, clean up, maybe clean out phone numbers, clean up phone numbers so that you get rid of all the extraneous characters, stuff like that. A stored procedure, on the other hand, can actually alter the structure of the database. You can make it create tables, drop tables, truncate tables. Eh? Then you create a function, and, well, Yes, then you could call the function from inside a stored procedure, or you could call the stored procedure from inside the function. The lim the, your imagination is the limit. Yeah, but they, if, you, if you, you end up calling one from the other, essentially. Now, when you define a function, tell me if this sounds familiar. You create a function, create function command. You give it a name. You give it some arguments with data types and defaults. You define the return type. You define some variable and some code. You return the value and the code ends. Does that sound pretty much like a Java function? You know, the only difference is, is where this one happens. With Java, it's up here, right? You go private function, uh, pri pri whatever, and you tell it the data type of the function is going to return. That's the only difference. Now, triggers are the big one. Triggers are event-driven actions. In actual fact, I got a flow chart on the next screen. I'm pretty sure, yes. Now, event-driven programming is something you guys haven't learned yet. And I don't know when it shows up in your curriculum. When I was going to school, then we're going back a few years, this brand new language had just cropped up. Everybody was amazed by what it could do because it was completely and 100% event-driven. In other words, if somebody clicked on a button, you could execute code. A, f a form would load, code would be executed. Anybody can guess what that language was? I took an extra class to take to learn this language. Visual Basic. Now, a lot of you are going, what the hell is even that? Pull up Wikipedia. Have a read. It was the premier language for business applications in the 90s. It allowed you to write an application on your desktop and you could respond to events. So as users used your application, you could respond to what they were doing, event-driven programming. For example, right now I'm just listening to the keyboard, in the, all the keyboards in the room, right? Every one of those clicks is an event. Not just one event, it's at least three events. Key down, key repeat, key up. So those are three events. Now, database servers that support proper triggers have certain events, and they are called moments. And these moments happen before or after either an insert, an update, or a delete. So you can fire off a chunk of code that happens before the insert. So if you, let's say you want to modify the data before it gets written into the database, you'd capture before insert or even before update, and at that point you could actually tell it, hey, we need to put in a timestamp, or we need to log something. That's what that does. Actually, before I swap 
presentations, I'll actually pull up a trigger to show you guys what the code looks like. The after code happens after it's been committed to the database. Then it gets written out. And actually, I'm going to actually do an example of what I'm talking about. How many people do I have here? One, two, I need a third. Where to Dan tonight? Nobody's sitting in the front row. And normally I usually need people in the front row for this. I'm gonna sacrifice my whiteboard marker for this. Okay. This isn't getting recorded, but they'll hear it. Okay. You're the before trigger. That means you're gonna you're allowed to modify the data before it gets written. You're the database processor. You're going to write the value. You're going to be the after trigger because you know you're the closest after. Now, I'm going to give you the paper. I'm going to say a word to you, any word. Change it to anything else. Just be PG, okay? What happens is he's going to tell you what to write. I'm not. Blue. Who cares? Okay, give me this. Change that. You can't because it's already been written. Right? So before trigger can change the data. After trigger gets to say, yay. That's not, but you could take this and now say, I'll give it to this guy to do something else with. Right? You could now take it and give it to him and he could do something else with it after the fact. However, you still can't change what he wrote. So that's the, the, the timing of the, the triggers. And what, what I'm talking about, there's um, all kinds of stuff that happens in there. Now here's, the, here's a flow chart. Now if you go of you that have actually downloaded the slides, we'll actually have a legible version of this. <laughs> that's the problem, the screen's running at like 720p. All right, so essentially I'll read the box as they go. The SQL command has been received. So essentially the command interpreter has received a command. The first thing it does is this is a decision point. It goes, is this a manipulation command? Is this an insert, an update, or a delete? Yes or no. If it's not, it tries to execute the query, returns the results, congratulations, it's done. However, is it an insert, update, or delete? So the next thing it does is, did it parse okay? So this is a bit when you hit run in your Java program and it tells you you forgot your semicolon and you kind of suck, or you know, something's not named right and it won't compile. Parsed okay. Is it a compilable uh, command? Yes. Then it checks to see if there's a before trigger, like him. Is it there? Yes or no. If it is, it executes it. If it's not, it skips and attempts to write the data to the database. And then, after it's been written, it passes off to the next person, the next thing in the job. It checks, is there an after trigger, yes or no? Did it if there is, it tries to do it. If it can't, that's too bad. It doesn't happen. And then it tries to execute it. Now, if anything goes wrong, and they finally fixed this in MySQL because for the longest time this was completely broken in MySQL. If anything goes wrong from the point where it parsed to the point where it outputs the results, it rolls everything back. So imagine that he was able to change the word, he was able to write the word, this guy you know, had a seizure and decided he couldn't do what I asked him to do. It would roll it back like none of it ever happened. Like this piece of paper would suddenly become blank again. Which is, you know, it's because it's written in a transaction. Now I'm just going to pull up an example of what some of that code looks like. So you have an idea of when I'm talking about code. The language looks very strange.
All right, we're going to go with this one. All right, so this block right here is a trigger definition. And even triggers are technically functions. It's just instead of returning a, a string or an integer, it returns you know, something called a trigger. And this is specific to Postgres. So if you're trying to do this in MySQL or Microsoft SQL Server, it's not going to look the same. That's why I don't really cover it that much, because it's very platform form specific instead of the generics. However, I define the name of the function. I say it's returning a trigger. Now, this weird thing here is telling it to start ignoring semicolons. Can you imagine if you could tell Java for the next 10 lines, ignore semicolons? Because this is not code for you. This is code for some other time. Up here, I declare my variables. Now, this is different from Java, because you guys are used to be able to declare variables wherever the hell you want, whenever you want, pretty much any way you want. And for those of us that are used to programming in languages like PHP, Python, or JavaScript, where we're not even type dependent, we can just, you know, it's typeless. We just go to town. Um, anybody here ever hear of a language called Pascal? Okay, any of you, did you ever see Pascal? In Pascal, Pascal is one of the best first programming languages to learn. Why? Because you cannot use a variable unless it's been declared. And you cannot declare a variable unless you declare it at the top of the program. So imagine you had variables inside your functions in your Java code, but you had to declare it as the very first thing in your function. All the variables you're going to use, including your iterators, you know, your for i equal blah, blah, blah. Imagine you had to declare your i at the top. <laughs> Jeez, what the hell was that? So Postgres is language, and this is the same with Oracle. You have to declare the variables at the top to use them. Then this thing called begin happens. Begin to end means this is where the code actually lives. Uh, this oracle is the same way. And what's happening is you can see here this new. That's the data being passed into the database. And I'm doing an if statement. If new shipped on is not null and new shipped on is not equal to the old shipped on. In other words, I'm saying, are they changing the shipped on date? Yes or no? Then I'm going to do some stuff. Um, I'm doing a loop in here. This looks really weird. Uh, I probably have a better loop somewhere else to demonstrate it with, but that's a loop looping through the records. You can see I'm doing select statements. I'm running inserts, updates, that kind of stuff, everything in here. And when it's done, it returns a value, which in this case is new. I will post these so you guys at least have examples of what these kinds of things look like. Um, I'm going to pull up. This one also. There we go. Right here, the first 13 lines. Slightly simpler example. This is just a straight function. It's a dice roll function. So this takes two arguments, number of sides, number of dice. So if you want to roll a 2d20, you could do it with this. So you tell it's 20-sided dice, and you're rolling it twice. I declare a total. It's an integer, because you can't have partial values on dice. I have my begin block. I'm initializing total to 0. Now, you'll notice that the, the equal sign's a little weird. When you have a language that uses the equal sign as the equality operator, you have to have something different to set values. So in Postgres and Oracle, it uses this colon equal thing. So that's, and Pascal, by the way, is the same. Eh? Nope, I'm just talking about it. I used to spend two and a half weeks on this. It was amazing. No, no, really, I used to do like a complete demo of everything at the class, everything behaving. Um, and then the loop is there, so it looks sort of like what you're used to seeing, right? For I in one two dots number of dice loop. This the only place in this language you're allowed to declare a variable on the fly is in the for loop. Go figure that one out. But this is saying, you know, for one until you hit the number of dice, <laughs> you loop. And then this is just math. 
this is nothing you guys haven't seen. You could probably, you guys could probably whip this up in Java in you know, fifteen twenty minutes. And those of you that already know Java could probably do it in three. It just depends on your comfort level. So that's what the functions look like, and then it returns an integer, and down here I tell it what language it's written in. If it was written in Python, I tell it it's written in PL Python. All right. So. That technically is what you needed for two of the questions on the exam. Now I'm going to switch over to the pseudo review. Okay. I'm going to go through the exam information first because that's you know the critical information you need to know. Practical exam is the week of December 2nd. No, not on December 2nd. The week of December 2nd. In your normally scheduled lab period, if you're supposed to be there at 5.30 on Thursday, <coughs> Dennis, you're going to be there at 5.30 on Thursday. If you're on Wednesday, congratulations, you're going to be there on Wednesday. Eh? That's life. It's the only time I'm requiring you to come to your assigned lab period. And there's just no way for me to manage keeping track of people being in the right place or not. Um, there will be an attendance sheet. You don't, don't sign it, you weren't there. If you weren't there, guess what you get? The reason for that is to make sure that you're not sitting with your friends outside the bits and bytes working on the exam together. If you're physically in the room, that means you were physically in the room. Now, it's not explained here, um, but when I get to the 10 questions, I'll go over it. It's one hour, 50 minutes. So you have an hour, 50 minutes to do it. It will be starting at, you know, one minute after your lab period is scheduled to start. So come in, sit down, make sure your laptop's charged and or plugged in. Make sure you have a functional laptop. If you don't have one, cry me a river. Practical. Not the theory, practical. I'm still talking practical here. It is 10 questions and only 10 questions. Yes, the questions are weighted lots. That's life. It is a randomly generated exam. Every student will have a slightly different and or very different exam from each other. It is broken down in Three easy, six medium, and one challenging question. Now, if you're comparing those to the practice questions I've given you guys, the first five or six would be the easy, the last four or five are the hard, the ones in the middle, whatever number that would be, will be fall under the medium type questions. Everybody gets a different exam because each of those questions are going to get pulled, pulled out of different pools. So. The three first questions are coming out of a pool of like 40 questions. And they come out in a random order. So even if you get the same questions as the guy next to you, or girl, or insert person here, they might be in a different order. So looking over going, see, I wonder what their answer for two was, isn't going to help you. All right. So that's the format of the exam. It is open book. You're allowed to use your labs, your notes, Stack overflow, stack overflow is even cool. No cell phones. Put those fucking things away. Because it follows with no chat clients. I, hit, I hear Discord, I fail everyone in the room. I hear that, dis and I know what Discord sounds like. I hear Discord go off, everybody in the room gets an instant zero. I don't give a fuck. I'm even recording this. This is going to YouTube. I've, you've been warned. Warn the other people that aren't here because I'm missing about 15, 20 people. Yeah. I'm 90% sure they'll be killed <laughs> by someone else sitting next to them. As a joke, if he goes, whatever foomp noise it makes, tap, depending on what sound profile you've got going, there are, I can guarantee there'll probably be violence within seconds. I probably won't need to fail everyone at that point. Same thing if I hear, shting, 
also known as Facebook. I know that sound too. <laughs> Skype, Microsoft Teams, Slack. I know what they all sound like. Yeah, you make it sound like I'm not going to be la looping through the room. Right, if I'm standing at the back of the room and I see a nice dark themed Discord window going, I'm like, you fucking idiot. What about Same difference. I still know what a chat window looks like. No chat program, which this is the first time I'm going to have to add this one. Leave your iWatch at home. Leave your insert preferred smartwatch at home because you're actually able now to actually practically text m complete messages on it. Some of them you can. They actually have enough gestures you're actually able to write on the damn things. No, I don't want to see your smart watch. If you want to take a watch in, be as analog as mine. Mine's digital and analog, but it's got no extra features. No talking, no flagging. I know enough sign language to actually identify if you're signing to each other. That's the other one. Flagging means if you're, if you're sitting there and I'm like, and you're like hunched over crying, and you look at your friend, you're like, if you start randomly gesturing at people in the room, I'm going to think you're asking for answers. Right? I mean, if you're one of those people whose hands are going all the time because you're French, <laughs> we, madame, right? Hands are going because we're French, we can't help it. There's a difference between this as opposed to. You know what that was asking, right? What's your answer for number two? Which is totally useless because the person next to you doesn't have quite the same question too anyways. Which in the end, I really don't care at that point because you won't be able to help each other unless you're literally transmitting the entire question. Okay. So, yeah, 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 yeah you're going to go, okay, I'm going to sign out an entire like 25 word question. Yeah, you'll spend like half the class just trying to get your point across. So that's a practical exam. <coughs> that's happening next week. The, eh? Because it's always Discord. And I have caught a group using Discord. So, theory exam. Theory exams on December 10th at 8 a.m. One, two, three, four points down. In B455 and 457, you must come to those rooms. You, if you look at access, it will give you the gym also as an option. No. The other five sections are writing in the gym. If you want to sit with 400 people to write your test and your exam not reach me, go ahead. It's one less test for me to grade. Yes. Because there's other people writing tests at, there's an exam in the, the gym at 10.30, at what, 3 or 2 o'clock? No, this is Tuesday. Programming's on Saturday. You're not the first one. Yeah, shh. I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> There's no classes during exam week. So you will come in at 8 a.m., write your exam, and unless you have another exam that afternoon, you're done. You go home. Oh, yeah. I, I hate it. You make it... S no. So, t continuing, because this is kind of important, so let's keep it down for a little bit till I'm done. When you see me take off the headset, so when we all get to rant. It's a two-hour exam, Scantron. It's 130 questions. For 120 points, there are 10 bonus questions. In the sense of, you write the entire exam, you get if you get 10 of the questions wrong, those are just ignored. 
So it's out of 120 points, but you know, 130 questions, that means there's 10 questions counting as bonus. Okay, hang on. Hat in the back. Okay, haircut. I'm going to cover that in a second. Okay? It is closed book. No gadgets. Zero zilch, none. No smartwatches, no computers, no tablets, no cell phones. Nothing. Sorry, guys, not my rules. Again, no talking or flagging. It's all the same exam. We'll be, uh, we're we have invigilators that we will be watching people gesturing. And during the written exam, just because I don't speak your language doesn't mean I know you're not asking the person next to you for the answer. <laughs> I might not be able to speak Farsi, but I still know what a question sounds like. I might not be able to speak insert other language here, whether it's Chinese, Vietnamese, insert other language here. You know what? Questions pretty much sound the same in every language. If I, it's like, dude, two. Yeah, okay. No, we're going to be watching. Bring HB pencils. You write it in ink, you will not get graded. Because it's Scantron. Scantron doesn't see ink. It has to be a pencil. Specifically, go for an HB pencil so it's nice and dark. Eh? You, you, because you got lucky. Just use a pencil. Eh? But if you did a sketch on an ink and it actually worked, it's a miracle. The, the odds are, yeah, somebody hand marked it. I won't hand mark your exam. I don't care. You were told. Bring a good eraser because you fuck up. Scantron's kind of picky. By the way, if you were curious on how Scantron works, because you've probably all filled in the bubbles, it reads from left to right. Right? So if you circled in A, and you realize it's C, and you erased A, but you left enough there that Scantron picks it up, it's going to take the A and ignore the rest of the line. So if you're ever curious on how it actually works, right, I'll turn around and visualize it for you guys, right? So you know how you got your nice little bubbles here? And then you go, oh, I'm there's A, right? And they fill it in. Make sure it's nice and dark. And then you go, oh, shit, it's C. Right? And you fill in C, like that, right? And then you erase A. You kind of do this, right? It's going to go scan, scan, scan. Oh, look, he kind of marked this room. Good enough, we're done. Return. So that's when I warn people about Scantron. I'm not a fan of Scantron exams because of that. Depends which machine scans it. The software makes a difference, and the one, one of them is a little weird. So it's like on the exam, you're going to have the paper, right? Obviously, can we do light on that paper to mark what's right now? Which is where I'm headed next. There's no more points on this. There are, to answer, I think it was somebody's question over there, if there's how many written questions. There are three written questions on the exam. Two diagrams and probably one word at the end. A slight ERD. Just wait. Okay. All right, here's the breakdown of the questions. Modeling data is from question 1 to 29. There's 29 questions for 29 points. Obviously, you can see how these numbers are adding up. Logical design. 30 to 52, logical designs. Okay, so modeling data is talking about entities, attributes, normalization, those kinds of questions. 29 questions about that. So know your normal forms. Know what an anomaly is. Know what an entity is. Know what a prime key is, because this teacher likes using the word prime instead of primary. He's from the, I don't know, he's still using terminology from 30 years ago, so... The prime key. Yes. Yeah, yeah. He's the only one that does. But, you know, it is. So, 
logical design covers tables and columns, relationships, which include your cardinality, your man whether it's mandatory, you know, one or more, one or many, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, basic SQL, as in, you're not going to have to write SQL statements, but it's going to show you an SQL command and ask you, what is this doing? Or it may say, you know, if you were trying to change the contents of a table, what command would you use? And it gives you four choices, and you pick the right one. SQL to advanced covers stuff like, what is an aggregate function? What's a left join? What's a right join? So if it says a left it, here's what this is, what does a left join do? And then there's the case study, which I'll be discussing in more detail in a minute. But essentially, uh, you got about a third of a page of text to read, and then 21 questions based on that block of text. So, yeah. Okay. Um, Hold on. 